The federal government is often described as a complex system of checks and balances among three co-equal branches of government. Another way to look at it is to see the federal government as four deliberative bodies stacked on a pyramid. At the bottom is the House of Representatives. It is the most powerful with 435 members. It is the most diffuse body, but its power is that in matter of impeachment, war, taxes, and spending, the House has the initiative. The second body is the Senate, with 100 members. Its sole power is the ability to say no to bills and motions passed by the House and to approve presidential appointments and treaties. There is no fixed number of justices, but by tradition, there have been nine justices on the court. The framers gave the court no initiative authority. It can only act if someone petitions it to act. However, the court has the power to say no to any action taken by the president, the Congress, and the states. At the top of the pyramid is the president, who has both the initiative and the power to say no to Congress through his veto. This model became broken in the 1950s and 60s as activist justices took it upon themselves to create new laws on their own. This seizure of initiative is the innovation that disrupted the constitutional system created by the framers, because there is virtually no check for a power the framers never anticipated. Elia Shapiro is the director of the Robert A. Levi Center for Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute. I spoke with him about the changing role of the Supreme Court. Mr. Shapiro, what was the original purpose of the Supreme Court, and has its role today outgrown what the Founding Fathers intended? Well, the Supreme Court, or the judiciary in general, is supposed to check the other branches. So if Congress passes a law that uh, goes beyond its constitutional authority, the, um, the uh, Supreme Court or, or lower federal courts are supposed to strike it down. If the president or an executive agency does something that's beyond uh, uh, their statutory authority, the, the courts are supposed to step in. Um, and the problem is, over the decades, uh, power in Washington, federal power, has grown and that's why the importance of the Supreme Court has grown. And so now we've sort of gotten used to the idea that every June at the end of term, the Supreme Court rules on three or four or half a dozen of the most important political issues in the country. When you think about it in the last decade, everything from health care, immigration, uh, racial preferences, abortion, uh, political gerrymandering, campaign finance, voting rights, you name it, a big political controversy, the Supreme Court uh, is involved. And it's not because the Supreme Court is trying to get involved and trying to earn a higher profile or gain more power. It's just a function of a system that has concentrated power in Washington and in a large and diverse country, you're gonna have differences of opinion that ultimately uh, end up resolved by the Supreme Court. I think ultimately uh, the way to reduce um, political polarization or the tensions, the toxicity that we're, we're living the last decade uh, is to push power back down to the states and the localities. If the Supreme Court doesn't have to decide these major issues of federal power or um, uh, executive authority or, or what have you, uh, then it won't be uh, as talked about. I think that's uh, that would be a, a good thing. But it's not just the Supreme Court. It's also Congress. It's also executive agencies. As power has centralized in Washington, all of these institutions uh, start playing a larger role. Yeah. You just mentioned that uh, these branches of government uh, shouldn't have so much power, but how can their powers be cut back? Well, just like it's taken decades to get to where we are, it'll take decades to to get back. Um, I think the Supreme Court starting in the 30s um, uh, started approving uh, uses of federal power that go beyond constitutional authority without amending the Constitution. Uh, and that's really the, the genesis of, of the, the growth of power uh, here in Washington. But it's not just that, it's also Congress abdicating its authority or delegating its power to the executive branch. That way, congressmen can say, you know, I voted for this great law, and, you know, I'll just have the, the bureaucrats sort out the details, 
And if people don't like the details, they can blame the agency. They're, they shouldn't blame me. I passed this great law. But it's the bureaucrats, it's the civil servants, it's the agencies uh, that are doing the bad things. And of course, uh, people can't lobby the agencies or the bureaucrats. They can only sue them. And that's why all of these major disputes over clashes of policy views or values end up in the courts rather than being decided in the halls of Congress. There's something unusual and unhealthy about uh, protests going on outside the Supreme Court rather than outside of Congress because all of these major clashes of uh, policy positions or values should be decided by our elected representatives, not pushed to the executive agencies and ultimately resolved in court. I also asked the Democratic side the same questions. Thomas B. Reston has spent a lifetime in politics, working in eight presidential campaigns at the national level and in countless local and statewide efforts. Reston was a political appointee in the Foreign Service under President Jimmy Carter, serving as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs. He's a civil rights advocate and author of Soul of a Democrat. Here's my discussion with him. Do you think the role of the Supreme Court has gone beyond what the framers had intended? No, I don't think so. Uh, in fact, I think the, uh, as a practical matter, the role of the Supreme Court is returning more or less to what the framers wanted, or certainly Mr. Uh, Chief Justice John Marshall, who was the great conservative who established the principle of judicial review over the actions of Congress so that the Supreme Court could knock out legislation by, that had been written and passed by the Congress. Uh, if the Supreme Court found the legislation to be unconstitutional. So uh, I think really the Supreme Court is returning to its earliest days as the staunch um, as the staunch uh, wall against an unbridled Congress. I think that um, it has always functioned as the great conservative part of the American government. And I think with the new conservative majority on the court, which has now been established, I think the court will return to its essential role.